Two years ago, a much anticipated movie based on a comic premiered to an extremely eager audience. The Crow became an instant classic. The Crow somehow tapped into a core audience that was usually ignored by Hollywood. And in the process, created an allegiance of fans that would forever remain faithful to the spirit of the film. Interest in the comic books of The Crow began to skyrocket to cult levels in the late 80s, and the attention of some of Hollywood's leading production teams were averted to the series. didn't think it would find an audience, but, um, but it did. For uh, the initial couple of issues, I believe he was going out to uh, well, only comic book shops at first and selling, you know, 2,000, 2,500 copies, which was startling at a grassroots level. The buzz started to increase dramatically around the time of the third and fourth issues to where people were vying to get T-shirts of the crow, which were hard to find, and uh, we would see people painted up in crow makeup, you know, uh, a, a real cult had formed around the uh, comic book. And so there certainly was a nerve that was struck right off the bat. I'm a James O'Barr fan. His art is great. It's the, the 1996 version of the superheroes. Everyone, you know, kind of realized at the end that we, we didn't really need to change this, that everything was there to make a good film. The material was very strong, violent, very dark. And I assured him that I was not of the mind that this in any way needed to be softened for a, a filmic uh, adaptation. I started it in... Uh, the real early 80s, 80, 81. Um, a couple years after uh, my fiance had been uh, killed by a drunk driver. So I was going through a lot of frustration and anger and I was getting really self-destructive. And I thought, well, I would try and work it out on paper as like a catharsis type thing rather than um, take it out of myself physically. Everyone was speculating about who, who was gonna play Eric, you know. Was, you know, when they told me Brandon had been hired for the part, I was really, really skeptical then. I was like, man, this is gonna be a kung fu movie and it's gonna go straight to video and no one's ever gonna see it. And, um, but then I, I came down to the set and I met Brandon and, you know, we, we hung out and we talked about it. He was big. I'm a big fan of the book. I mean, he knew virtually every line of the book. When The Crow opened in theaters in May of 1994, it was the biggest opening in the history of its distribution company, Miramax Dimension Films. I saw the movie, The Crow, opening night, Man's Chinese Theater. It was like my third week in L.A. And my friends took me to see the film. Sitting, I walk in, and we expected the, the theater to be totally deserted because it, it seemed to me like a fairly obscure, almost art house film. The theater is packed. I saw it, and I, I left the theater. I was very upset, um, probably because I'm 48 now, and at the time I'd, I'd been, you know, imagining myself uh, gliding into middle age and, uh, you know, writing s sensitive songs and <laughs> this sort of thing, and I, I got assaulted by the movie and just thought, oh my God, is that what I'm up against? Then once I calmed down, I realized how very good it was. And it was kind of like a new genre. I don't think anything like that had really been done before. Um, so uh, at this point in time, like 65 million people have seen that film, and I'm just, you know, I'm dazzled by that. I think that a lot of the people that watched The Crow were the kind of kids like I was when I was a kid who were maybe um, out of the mainstream for one reason or another, you know, didn't 
They weren't the jocks, they weren't, you know, the super brains kind of thing. They were the, the kids that slipped between the cracks. And now, of course, all the studios are trying to tap into that. Yeah, we'll get the Crow audience. Me out. I don't even really think of them as fans. I, I, I think of them mostly as, like, friends I haven't met yet, you know? With the success of the film, the soundtrack went on to sell three million copies featuring Platinum Max, such as The Cure, Nine Inch Nails, and Stone Temple Pilots. Very often you go into a film and you hear songs you've heard many times before. And one of the things we feel so special about The Crow and The Crow soundtrack is that the songs are written with the movie in mind. The songs were used to really propel the film along. Those are really powerful segments. With the success of the film, naturally the idea of creating a series of Crow movies began to spring up. But just as tragedy was the inspiration for James Obar's original graphic novel, a new tragedy would overshadow any thought of continuing the Crow movie series. During filming while completing one of his last scenes for the Crow, Brandon Lee was tragically killed in an accident. With the enormous popularity of the film, an entire generation of fans had come to see The Crow as Brandon Lee. How then could the filmmakers continue the movie series? Well, a lot of Crow fans, uh, I think, argued that we shouldn't have released the first film either. I think that uh, this, the film was a great legacy to Brandon. Without Brandon, the filmmakers knew that his character, Eric Draven, would not continue, but The Crow would. And so I hit upon this idea that if The Crow could bring Eric Draven back, then it could bring somebody else back, and perhaps it had brought people back before Eric Draven. And then I hit upon this idea that there had been these kind of tortured souls going all the way back through history that had been brought back for one reason or another. This world is the end of the Earth. It's, um... Edgar Allan Poe meets Trent Reznor. Medieval Gothic meets meets Geiger. And there's no there are no rules in this world. Everybody plays by their own. The next film takes place eight years later in the desolate City of Angels. In the Crow City of Angels, Vincent Perez plays Ash Corvin when Ash and his young son are viciously murdered by a gang. The Crow brings his soul back from the land of the dead to put the wrong things right. It's Sarah who helps Ash make the transition to the Crow. The idea of Sarah was to take us, um, it, to me, she was where the audience was at the end of the last movie. And to me, Sarah's character was that notion, if you like. And she's an artist who's on the brink of madness and in the depths of her sorrows. And then she meets Ash, who's the crow. Iggy Pop, one of the originators of the punk movement, has his largest movie role to date. Do they think I'm afraid of you? classic elements from the first one are are in this one without really being repetitious. You know, whereas the, the first film was kind of like a nightmare. This one was kind of like a dream. I think that we're obsessive about not repeating some formula, about bringing a, a new invention to it all and, and pushing it further. I think as long as we can remain true to the vision of James O'Barr and to the caliber of work and artistry that has been involved in the first film and certainly is involved in the second, I think that uh, we'll have adoring fans for many years to come.